Okay. So, um, given the breadth of the audience, I thought I'll uh, start with um, uh, a little bit of introduction about uh, distributed algorithms, which is the sort of uh, area that spawned this uh, line of work that I'm going to be talking about. Um, so, distributed algorithms, we, um, we have a network that's represented by a graph. Um, and so it's uh, uh, each node in the network um, is connected to some neighbors, which essentially gives you which node can talk to <coughs> which. <coughs> um, I've been having some throat problems. I hope I survived this talk. Mm. Um, so uh, so the, each node in this network is uh, something that can com uh, do a little computation. Um, and uh, the network as a whole has to behave uh, in some reasonable way. And for example, one, um, uh, let me start off by just giving you a taste of a, a type of distributed algorithm that, uh, uh, that, that people talk about often. It's called agreement. So let's say uh, every node in this network starts off with, with one bit, either a zero or a one. Some nodes start with zero, some nodes start with one. Uh, sometimes all of them start with zero, sometimes all of them start with one. You just want to agree, reach a uh, point in, uh, reach a state where every node um, is um, agreeing on the same bit value, say one or zero, uh, except that the important requirement is that if you agree on zero, there must have been at least one node that started off with zero, and if, you, uh, if the entire network agrees on a one, then the entire, uh, at least one node should have started off with a one. So uh, it's a very simple problem, and I'm sure you can immediately see solutions for it. Um, so one simple way that this can be solved is you just flood ones. If you have a one, you send it to your neighbors. If you receive a one, you send it to your neighbors. And in, assuming you know the diameter uh, of, this, of this graph, eventually everybody, if there was a one in the beginning of, the, of time, everybody's gonna have the one, and you can decide on a one. So it's obviously a very, very simple problem, but gets you a sense of how uh, these, uh, these sort of distributed algorithms uh, work. And normally, uh, one, one little detail I want to bring out now is typically we assume some, um, uh, on one extreme, we assume that the network is synchronous, which means that there's a clock that says, okay, this is time step one, and everybody sends something, and, and people receive, and then they do some local computation. So then another uh, tick happens. Um, second time step, again, you send something, you receive something, and you do some local computation. So this is the typical uh, assumption that uh, people make. Uh, and the, on the other extreme, there's the asynchronous version where there's no such assumption, and um, you know, let's not go there too much. Um, but just to give you a sense, I mean, so this is a very, very simple problem that I talked about. Um, but in what people realized is that this problem, is, as simple as it sounds, uh, has some uh, deep difficulties in it. For example, um, if, the, if there are failures, if, there are, if the nodes can fail in the network, okay, and then there, there are some problems. Uh, agreement, um, uh, for example, in, in the asynchronous setting, even if one node fails, there's no hope of reaching agreement. So the famous uh, result by Fisher, Lynch, and Patterson. Um, and uh, so this, there's a lot of uh, subtle things that happen, um, small changes to the network, I mean, uh, s s small modifications, and you run into very interesting situations. Um, so how many of you have heard of the paradox or uh, of the ship of the Thesus? Of ship of Thesus, anybody? Um, so, okay, so, um, so what, uh, the way I see uh, uh, distributed algorithms research is like for the last uh, some 30 years or, or more, uh, people have been looking at faults where nodes in the network fail, okay? But in the last uh, decade and a half or so, and maybe more so in the last uh, few years, people have started looking at just networks that um, keep surviving. And this kind of reminds me of the ship of the Seuss because you know, uh, like for example, let's look at the internet. Internet has survived for 40 years now, but pretty much none of the servers that existed 40 years ago is, is, is there in the network today. So it's a constantly evolving uh, process, and yet uh, it's capable of uh, 
uh, managing itself. And so in some sense, uh, my, my recent interest is um, how do uh, networks evolve and how do you design algorithms that um, uh, run on such evolving uh, networks. So that's uh, the context of, uh, of my interest that uh, has spawned this work. So now I'll get to, um, is there any questions on distributed algorithms? Quick questions, yes. Oh, oh, sorry, I forgot I should have explained the shape of this. <laughs> it's, uh, it's this um, ancient uh, paradox, the Greeks asked this question. Suppose you have a ship um, where each uh, plank uh, decays and you replace it with a new plank. And after a few years, you've replaced every plank. Is it the same ship or is it a different ship? So that's the, that's the context, that's the question. Thanks for asking the question. Um, so, uh, so with that sort of backdrop, let me get to this uh, talk. So let me acknowledge my co-authors here. Uh, um, this is Anisur, Ihab, uh, Gopal, Peter, and Eli. Um, so this was work done uh, mostly when I was visiting uh, Gopal in Singapore. So uh, the, uh, the um, context in which this uh, work was done was peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks. Um, and we all have used many peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, probably um, so, uh, uh, things like uh, BitTorrent and things like that. I'm sure at some point people have used this. Uh, um, and a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer networks have a little bit of central control. And one of our aspirations was how do we build peer-to-peer -peer networks, or at least theoretically think about peer-to-peer -peer networks in a completely decentralized uh, fashion. Okay? Uh, just to give you a sense of the architecture, you have the whole internet, but not every computer is part of the peer-to-peer -peer networks. There's only a few nodes in the network that are part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And the important thing is that now they have to organize themselves uh, in, in, a, in a fashion that uh, makes, it, makes themselves useful um, for whatever reason they're designed, okay? And this, such, this sort of uh, organization of this, these nodes is called the overlay network, okay? And an important thing to keep in mind is these are just logical edges. So when you have two nodes in the peer-to-peer -peer network with one edge, uh, an edge connecting them, the, it doesn't really mean that there is a direct route from one node to the other. It just, it's, it's using the underlying uh, TCP IP protocol that um, internet uses. It's just that logically now these two nodes know each other's addresses and can talk to each other. Okay? And this is actually, uh, overlay is just a con mostly a convenience network because if this node, uh, which is not connected to this node, just knows the address of this node, they can still communicate. Okay? And this is helpful because now one way to think about it is the, the, um, the nodes in this network are really, uh, they form a real, I mean, in some sense, a complete graph. They can talk to each other, any, uh, any pair of nodes can talk to each other, provided they know the other node's address. What the overlay does is guarantees that connection. Um, okay, so now, um, uh, in peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, um, uh, the, the uh, the the uh, the key challenge is the uh, the churn. Uh, what empirically people have seen is that in every hour, 50% of the nodes are renewed. Okay, and so this is where you see the dynamism: the nodes leaving and nodes coming into the uh, network. Because how do you use a peer-to-peer -peer network? You log in, you accomplish your purpose for whatever you logged in, and then when you're done, uh, you log out and leave. So uh, you're really, uh, nodes don't persist forever in a peer-to-peer -peer network. So this heavy churn means that we need to be uh, careful in how we design um, algorithms. So, um, and, but then there are robust peer-to-peer -peer networks that are actually built. There's lots of papers. Uh, we, our main interest was to try and understand what makes them uh, so robust, and can we mimic them theoretically and prove something robust about them, okay? And um, so that was our goal. So um, we want to take a very fundamental problem in peer-to-peer -peer systems. Of course, that's to take a single data item, uh, think of it as a key value pair, store that item in this network, um, and you have to do that despite the dynamism, because if you just store it in one or two nodes, those nodes can leave, and so you're left with no 
um, uh, the, the, the item is gone. And we wanted, did want to use some heavy machinery. We wanted to use some simple scalable techniques, and that's where the random box comes in. This is the technique that we use, and uh, that's where the mathematics becomes interesting. And we want to be able to use random box to do much of our work and uh, give some rigorous proofs against, and be able to prove something against an oblivious uh, adversary. So this was um, our goal. And so we dip into the, um, some understanding of dynamic networks. Um, so in order to understand peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks, well, we kind of frame them as dynamic networks. But dynamic networks have been studied. Uh, and mostly in the theoretical sense, they've been studied as edge dynamic networks. What we wanted to introduce was um, given, motivated by peer-to-peer -peer networks, we wanted to introduce uh, dynamic networks with churn as well. Okay, when, by churn I mean nodes coming into the network and nodes leaving the uh, network. So that was this is what we wanted to do. Uh, so here's the model for dynamic networks, which is uh, with churn, which is what we use to model peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, and we're going to assume uh, synchrony. So uh, the uh, network is synchronous. So we have a clock that tells you which what round we are in, and uh, at each time step. A node sends, uh, each node sends uh, messages to its neighbors, then they receive messages from their neighbors and perform some local um, computation. So this is repeated every time step. Okay? And uh, then we have adversarial dynamism, meaning now the, the communication graph is not just one graph like the way I've shown over here. Instead, it's actually a sequence of graphs. And uh, at, this is G0 at time 0. This is the graph that we have at time 1. We have this graph and so on. And um, so this, this is uh, given to us by an adversary. So the adversary is an oblivious advers adversary. It knows the exact algorithm that we are using to design our uh, uh, data storage system. And its goal is to design the churn and the edge dynamics um, in such a way that it will be the worst case for our algorithm. Okay. However, the dynamism has, uh, has to play by some rules, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, we assume that, so because this churn, each node enters the network at some point and then could potentially leave the network uh, at some point. And uh, the churn, now the, uh, the adversary has to obey one rule, uh, one of uh, a few rules. One rule is that the churn cannot exceed n over polylog of n uh, nodes per time step. Um, which means that uh, at every time step, if you have a network, n over polylog of, the, uh, of n nodes leave the network, and a new set of them come in. We, we are assuming stable network size, so the number of uh, nodes churned out should be equal to the number of nodes churned in. Okay? So this, uh, this kind of mimics what happens in peer-to-peer -peer networks where peers are just constantly entering and leaving the network. Okay? And peer-to-peer um, -peer networks keep changing their topology, so we're also going to assume that the edges also change. So this is the, the setting in which we have to design our algorithm. Um, there's one important uh, connectivity assumption we're making. A lot of peer-to-peer -peer networks are fairly well connected, even though they're highly dynamic. And for, that, for this reason, what we're going to assume is that the graph each, at each time step is well connected, in particular a deregular uh, expander, uh, alpha expander. What do we mean by that? Um, so uh, what is an alpha expander here? Uh, if you look at a graph G, we say that it's an alpha expander if for every subset S uh, that's not too large, uh, not more than half the cardinality of the vertex set, this condition should hold. The neighborhood of S should be at least alpha times the cardinality of S itself. So uh, this is, uh, in particular, this is vertex expansion. Um, and we're assuming that our graph, uh, at uh, our network at every time step will be um, uh, an alpha expander. Okay. And this, is, uh, uh, this may seem like a strong assumption, but it's actually a very common assumption made in peer-to-peer -peer networks because a lot of randomly formed graphs are, actually, uh, are very good expanders. 
And uh, in particular, um, one reason why this is, uh, we are um, comfortable making this assumption is that we also have some other work, more recent work, where we show that um, we can actually maintain expansion. Um, yes? Cardinality is the number of elements in a set. Uh, correct, yes. So here, uh, um, uh, so the, if you look at any set, subset of the vertices uh, in, in this graph, say for example, if you just, and this has to hold for any subset, so there's, um, it's a, in that sense it's a pretty strong set. So if you look at any subset S of the vertices, and you look at the number of, and potentially, the number of neighbors of that set, that should be at least uh, alpha times the cardinality of this set. Alpha is us usually like something like 0 0.1 or something like that, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So um, if you look at, uh, except if you look if you look at a set S that's more than half the size of the vertices, then it uh, then it becomes hard, right? Especially in particular, if S is V, then there's no neighbors for that set. So you have to limit yourself to a smaller set S, at least no larger than half the vertex size. So this is the um, context in which we have to design an algorithm. And uh, so what we, um, and of course we do, uh, we, we, the nodes can communicate via message passing. Uh, they cannot communicate very large messages. And, um, and as I mentioned, these appear to be a networks where you can communicate via uh, 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 edges, but you can also do direct communication if you know the uh, IP address of a particular node. Okay, so I'm going to, um, uh, interest of time, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give you, a, um, uh, I'll walk through these things a little bit faster and then get to the random walks part. Um, so what we're trying to do is the following. We are trying to take a, a data item, it's a key value pair, and we're going to store them um, in different locations within the network, okay? And we're gonna try and maintain them. And the reason why we have to do this is the following. If the network has churn of the order of n over polylog of n, and it's adversarial, the problem is the following. In polylog n steps, the entire uh, network can be a new network, okay? All nodes could have left and new nodes could have come in, which means that if you just store the data item in, one, uh, in a few locations and you leave them there, they're going to be wiped away, okay? So the important thing, therefore, is to somehow maintain the data item. And the way to do that would be to not just store it in a few locations, but also keep refreshing it, keep moving it around and keep refreshing it so that the data, items, data, data item doesn't get lost with churn, okay? And then, but then if you keep moving it around, it becomes hard to find it. And so you have to have a search mechanism for it. And that's uh, this uh, search structure that we, um, we built. Okay, so uh, the key technique is the following. If you, with the, with the amount of churn that we're talking about, any task that you want to perform, um, whether it be storing an item, searching for an item, or anything like that, if you entrust it to one uh, entity, one node, then uh, the problem is it could get churned out. So what's the way around it? Uh, we, any activity in this network, what we do is we create a committee, and the committee has sufficiently, not too many, because that would bloat the activity, but uh, sufficiently large number of nodes, so some theta of login, uh, randomly chosen nodes, so the adversary cannot predict who's actually doing the activity, and you delegate that activity, uh, that task, to that committee, okay? And that committee performs the, uh, the task, okay? And so this is, this is, uh, this is the whole, uh, the main crux of this uh, work. So we break down the activities that we need to do in such a way that the, the committees uh, take care of the, the activity so that um, uh, the task keeps going on even though nodes get uh, churned out. Um, so let's look at uh, how a, a committee can be created. And now keep in mind that if the committee is created in a predictable way, then an adversary can simply remove the nodes in the committee. So it has to be the, the, uh, 
the way it's done, therefore, is you have to randomly choose uh, nodes and send them invitations to form a committee whenever a task has to be performed. And then the nodes um, uh, respond to this invitation, form the committee, take over the task. And then, um, so that's how a committee is created. Then a committee has to be maintained, because if, if a committee of login nodes are created, again, churn could uh, wipe them out. Um, and so you have to, um, every few, every, uh, in this case, login rounds, recreate the committee. Otherwise, you will lose all the um, committee members. So um, all of this at the, at the heart of it is uh, being able, the ability to choose random peers. Um, but the problem is, since the, the nodes are constantly churning, how do you um, randomly sample from the network is the context. So I'm going to skip the other details. So basically, the, the um, idea I want to leave you with is um, you have, and, and we can do even more complex tasks, whatever task you want to perform in this uh, network, the key is to be able to find uh, some random peers to take on that responsibility. Uh, hand over the responsibility to those peers, and let them uh, do the task. And uh, th th that's basically the committee. And the committee somehow has to figure out a way to maintain itself, and so that the task is completed. That's, that's really the, the goal. But the key is to be able to find random peers when needed. And that's, um, that's what we are going to focus on in the um, rest of the time. So, um, let me move on to the part about random walks. Um, so here's how we do the uh, random sampling. And this is very, very simple. It's, it's a simple um, sort of a background daemon that can keep running in this network. So at every time step, what we do is the following. Um, we, in each node, and this is the, each node in the network, initiates some theta of log and random walks. Okay? And um, these random walks have the, the um, starting nodes ID, and, uh, and it has a timer set with theta of log n rounds. Okay? And uh, these random walks walk in the network in a random fashion. And as you can imagine, uh, um, the, 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 the uh, random walk tokens are forwarded until this timer expires. Okay? And every time it uh, makes one random walk step, the timer decrements, so it'll expire at some point. And when, once the random walks have uh, walked, it's um, uh, they, uh, is expired, it's consumed. And what, what that means is that once the random walk has walked for this theta of log n rounds, um, it's reached a point where it's, it, um, it's, it's reached some node, and that node has the random walk token, and that token contains the address where it started which means that that peer node where it started is a random sample in the network. And that's what we uh, use. And uh, the theorem that we uh, can prove here is that at, um, after, well, this, this process will take a little bit of bootstrapping, but after the bootstrapping, most nodes in the network will get um, theta of log n uh, node samples every round chosen uniformly at random from most nodes. So once the, this, this um, uh, run this uh, sampling algorithm is started uh, and it's been bootstrapped, at every time step you're going to get theta of log n. Every node, I mean most nodes, and not all of them, some of them can be hidden away. Uh, most nodes are going to get uh, theta of log n random walk tokens. And each one of those random walk tokens is a random sample into the set of peers uh, in the network. And crucial to this is that this underlying um, uh, graphs, the network graphs are expanded graphs. And uh, so, uh, and the reason why that holds is uh, there's some uh, well-known theory of random walks in expanded graphs in particular. Um, I, in the interest of time, let me quickly mention the result. So basically, um, we have this notion called the mixing time of a random walk. It's the time it takes for a random walk to reach stationary distribution within uh, the graph. And when you think of a deregular graph, the stationary distribution is the uniform distribution. And when you think of an expander graph, uh, you, um, you reach the stationary distribution, that's the time, time to mix, 
you reach the stationary distribution in O of log n uh, time steps. Um, uh, of course, this, is, this theory is for static graphs. And what we were able to show is that this theory essentially, with, with, a, with, a, um, with some approximation, essentially holds for uh, dynamic graphs as well. And the way we were able to show it is the following. Uh, well, uh, this is some previous work in uh, which, um, in particular, uh, Dasarma, Gopal, Pandurangan, and uh, Anisur had uh, worked on this. Uh, when, the, when the graphs are um, expanders and they are edge, uh, only uh, displaying edge dynamism but without node churn, what they showed is essentially uh, the exact same results in the static graphs hold uh, in these uh, edge dynamic graphs as well. Um, and uh, that the, the proof is not very hard to see, um, but this is this is a fairly uh, they used a fairly standard argument. Uh, where things become difficult is when you have churn, because random walks can die. Um, whenever a node, uh, when, a, uh, when a random walk token is at a node that's going to be churned out, it's going to go with the random uh, with the node that was churned out. So. Um, so that's, a, that's one problem. The other problem is can the adversary use churn in such a way that the random walks can somehow be biased? That's another uh, problem as well. So these are two issues that we need to somehow uh, figure out how to overcome. And um, so that's, where, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the result that we showed. Uh, we show that most random walks uh, nevertheless mix. And, uh, uh, so, uh, in particular, this is the theorem that we proved. Um, so let's uh, so let we define um, uh, pi g s d t to be the probability that a random walk starting at node s at time step zero ends at node d. And these are two arbitrary nodes s and d in G t in um, round t. This is this is uh, this probability pi. Um, and tau, you remember, is the mixing time of, a, of an expander graph. Um, and this is the theorem we proved. Suppose churn is at most O of n over polylog of n. For, um, what we show is that there exists a large set of nodes, and a picture will help. There exists this large set of nodes, and this is the graph at time step 0. This is the graph at time step 2t, uh, 2 tau. There's a large set of nodes such that if you pick any two nodes, s, here and D here, the probability that a random walk that starts here reaches this node D is equally likely uh, as other nodes in this thing. So in particular, uh, for any S in the core and D in the core, the, this probability pi that a random walk starting at S will reach D at time step 2 tau is theta of 1 over n. So, uh, and this, this uh, core has uh, a large cardinality, in particular n minus uh, little o of n. Um, and uh, I'll just leave you with a sense of how we prove this. What we already know is uh, when you have graphs that do not lose vertices, that is only displaying edge uh, dynamism, we know that random walks mix perfectly. So what we do is in the analysis, we allow um, um, Basically, for the purpose of analysis, what we do is we uh, remove the effects of churn. We basically introduce some notion of, a, of ghost tokens, um, that even though when a node is removed, uh, we don't remove the, the uh, random walks on that node. We put, put the random walks back into the network for the, uh, and then, so then uh, we can show, well, then it essentially becomes a graph with no churn. Um, so the mixing time properties are uh, hold. But then what we uh, need to be able to show is that, uh, well, basically, uh, what we've showed is only in this sort of a ghost network where there is no churn, we've shown the result. And then somehow we have to simulate the results in the network which, with, uh, which does have churn. So this is the technical part um, I'm going to be, unfortunately, skipping uh, in the interest of uh, time. Um, but. Uh, what I'm going to do is quickly jump to um, sort of a, uh, a, a sort of a, an open family of problems that I've been thinking about. So this is in part related to what I've been uh, what, what the kind of work that I'm doing, but also in part related to the kind of discussions that um, we've all been having. 
So the family of the, the, the main question is, um, well, we've talked about interesting processes. So we've talked about contact processes. We've talked about uh, other forms of processes. Um, and one question that I have is, is there an interesting family or uh, framework for random evolving graphs? So this, this work, uh, in this work, it, it's somewhat pessimistic because we're assuming that the, um, uh, that the churn is, uh, is adversarial. In real networks, the churn is not as adversarial. It's there's something, I mean, there's a lot of interesting properties that you can see in real world evolving graphs. Um, so can we, uh, are, are there interesting ways in which we can design evolving graph processes? Uh, that's a question that I uh, have, and it's, uh, it's not completely well-defined what even I'm asking, because it's, it's somewhat, um, I, I, I'm not very clear as to what the exact properties one needs to, uh, you know, achieve in this, um, in this process. Uh, some of the ideas, for example, um, some of the ways that people have looked at it is, um, um, so let's say you have a 2D grid, you have several, um, uh, shall we say, agents doing random walks in these 2D grids. Whenever they come close enough, say, reach the same node, then they're connected. When they're not in the same uh, node, they're not, uh, uh, same grid point, they're not connected. So that, so that will induce a, a sort of a, an evolving uh, uh, graph. So that's something people have uh, thought about. And, uh, and a few other things. In the interest of time, I'll just uh, um, quickly open up, I mean, at least leave you with this thought. Is there, for example, if you think of static graphs, there is classic GNP and GNN, the Erdős, any graphs and things like that. My question is, um, um, is there something, I mean, and, and it's not like every static, I mean, Erdős, any graphs are only useful to some extent in terms of the real world, but then they are a good framework to, think about in, when we think of a random graph. And it's helped us design interesting algorithms. It's helped us gain a lot of insight. Is there something fundamental like that in uh, random graphs, uh, random evolving graphs? Is there some uh, fundamental framework that we can think of? And this is a question that I've, I've been having. And I'll be very interested in having discussions with anybody who's interested in that. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, yes, I'm sorry, I didn't. Um... Uh -huh. We can uh, definitely be interested. Thank you. Thank you.